Now I think we're uh, live. So good morning everyone and welcome to our webinar this morning on returning to work with a spinal cord injury. We have three wonderful speakers for you today. We have Fiona who is an OT in the NRH who's going to be discussing the vocational program and then we have two of our wonderful peer support volunteers Karen and Connor who are going to share their own experiences of returning to work. Uh, for anyone who hasn't been on Zoom before, there is a little chat box at the bottom, so you feel free to pop in your questions in there. And towards the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So we'll start with Fiona, because you have a presentation to share with us, and then we'll move on to Karen and Connor. Uh, and any questions, feel free to message us. Okay. So, okay. Fiona, you can share your screen if you like. Okay, great. Otherwise, you can go on mute. Hmm. There we go. Okay, hi everybody. Um, as Philippa said, um, I'm a, an occupational therapist. I'm working here in the National Rehabilitation Hospital in the vocational service. So I'm delighted to be able to have a chat to you about what, what I do um, and then my involvement with the vocational program today. So um, just want to go next. How do I? Oh, there we are. So what I'm going to do today is just just talk about sharing our experiences of work uh, and uh, Karen and Connor will chat more in depth about that um, the, I'll also identify and explore the factors for consideration in a person returning to work um, they'll include your readiness to return to work um, your timing of returning to work the impact of your, I suppose, the impact of the disability or functional difficulties, which we always use as therapists, that term functional, um, but basically it's your ability to get on with your day-to-day -day activities um, and uh, on your return to work and also considering your pre-injury work role and its demands because obviously that's going to have a bearing on your transition back to work. Um, I'll also discuss the facilitators and barriers of your return to work and the relevance of a supportive network, be it family, community, employment supports, including and not underestimating the importance of an understanding and accommodating employer. So. So I suppose why work? Um, the benefits certainly are, to, it provides a routine and a structure to our week, which we as humans, we tend to thrive in. Um, it gives us financial independence. It provides a, a sense of identity, a defined role. Um, it has positive health consequences. People, when they're in a routine, in a work routine and getting self-fulfilled, from their work uh, and job satisfaction they tend to be less anxious less depressed and uh, they have an enhanced quality of life it also promotes peer socialization it gives us confidence as I've said in our abilities and our competence in our work and that helps to assist with mood um, it can act as a distractor from pain um, and it can be perceived as getting back to normal, particularly after a significant life event. Um, and as a patient said to me, I'll never know if I could do it unless I try. So I suppose the involvement in this service, being able to access this service is of relevance and importance. So the facilitators, um, oh, sorry, I've gone got back there. Now, how do I get back to, sorry. I have to go out of this I'm after pressing a sorry <laughs> sorry there Philippa I went out of that no bother the joys of technology yeah and you can see I'm new to this where did my thing go so if you pop back down to your share screen oh that yeah should be open uh, oh yeah here it is and how do I go back, Philippa? How do I go back um, to... Press the back arrow as opposed to the forward one, but if you're press, pressing up or down. Yeah, I just couldn't see that when I, when I was looking at it. Um, i just do from the current slide, so this should work. Now, okay, so, oh yeah, there we are. Sorry about that, everybody. Now, so the facilitators. <laughs> so, um, the age at the time, let's see if I can get rid of this actually, uh, just minimize that because it's blocking my 
Okay. So the age at the time of injury is important um, and the level of importance that the person attaches to work is a big facilitator. Obviously, access to transport, be it to be able to drive to work, um, but also to be able to access possibly public transport or to um, have a lift with a colleague, a work colleague or some, some other family member um, is important. Um, and then employer support is, is of huge relevance as well. And the barriers uh, to return to work, obviously, in contrast, would be unable to drive or use public transport. Those of you who have gone through the NRH would be aware that we have um, the driving assessment service here with, through the IWA. It's currently fin, Finbar McDade who will take you out in the car and um, go through building up your confidence in driving, possibly uh, using hand controls or alternative um, devices to assist. Um, and getting confident in driving in the, uh, in the busy busy traffic um, and then the OTs working with you and the physios would hopefully work on accessing public transport while you're an inpatient here or possibly an outpatient just building up your confidence in accessing uh, that. Um, another barrier might be a lack of understanding of the difficulties especially the hidden problems such as bowel and bladder problems or pain or fatigue and they are very understandable and very real. Um, so then the vocational assessment. So when somebody comes in to me for vocational assessment, I suppose I just have you there in the, in the center uh, box there. And what I will be looking at is your previous roles, be it family, within your family and within your work. And um, the psychosocial evaluation. So um, your uh, the supportive network that you have and your emotional state, your coping, your adjustment, all of that. Um, the cognitive and perceptual evaluation may not be carried out uh, for somebody who has sustained a spinal cord injury because you may not have um, a dual diagnosis of a, a brain injury on top of that. Um, but if you did, I can work on that with you. Uh, communication as well would be a big factor. And then functional evaluation. So I might go through some some work samples with you to assess your speed and your accuracy in um, possible work demands and see how you cope with those within the clinical setting. Um, and then obviously I'd have a medical history and maybe any comorbidities possibly such as arthritis or something like that that might also compound your um, ongoing difficulties that you're, you're experiencing. So the problems that are affecting a return to work, so the personal factors or impairments would be your mental or physical fatigue, um, cognition, so your thinking skills, your ability to concentrate, ability to, to focus on the task. People obviously experiencing pain, that, that can be a huge distractor um, to their ability to function within the workplace. So managing that um, is, is a key factor in your ability to, uh, to work, um, your communication and your language skills, bowel and bladder, so access to clean accessible bathroom facilities, your mood and your confidence and how that interplays with your uh, work demands. And then meeting your employer's expectations, that can be quite a stressful um, factor as well, just because of your pre-injury um, work status and your work competence and then coming back with an injury and trying to fit back into your previous work role and meet your previous work capacity, that can place certain stressors. Uh, and then obviously your perception of others, like you, you kind of be thinking, well, what do your employer think about your work status, your colleagues, your friends? Um, and if you're not back at work, there might be a question why you're not back at work. Um, Difficulties can be hidden in plain sight, as I've mentioned, those pain, bowel and bladder, fatigue, and then the financial pressures affecting return to work, mortgage, dependency, you might feel under pressure to return to work sooner than you're possibly ready, be it mentally or physically ready to return. Um, so the so return to work is influenced by barriers and facilitators, as, as you can see. So the environmental um, so sometimes what I do as part of the assessment is I will do a work site visit. So if you have a job to return to um, and your employer is happy for me to go out with you, I will 
uh, do a work site visit. So I'll go out with you to your place of work and I'll just assess the physical environment, like your accesses or parking facilities adjacent to your building. And if not, where can you park? The accessible bays or an accessible car parking space, or can there be one designated for you? Um, the physical environment, the access, is it an automatic door opening or is there a push button mechanism if you're a wheelchair user or if you're using assistive devices that just helps with ease of access? Um, obviously, is there an internal lift? Are there steps and the, ba the bathroom doors? Are they very heavy? Is there a, a visual panel that you can see people coming in and out just so you're not going to be knocked down? So there's lots of different factors I'll, I'll take into account. Um, I'll also look at the ergonomic setup of your workstation station, particularly if you're in an office-based environment. Um, so I'll be going through with your employer possible ergonomic supports, like an ergonomic chair, maybe a height adjustable table, so that um, if you have pain or you have difficulties sus with sustained sitting, that you can alternate your work position. So that will prevent muscle stiffness and pain. Um, and also maybe suggest maybe some ergonomic supports or devices that might be of use. Um, you might have linked in with the um, electronic assistive technology department here while you're an inpatient in OT and they may have linked you in with naturally speaking software trials or particular type of uh, mouses to assist with um, your accessing the computer and use of sticky keys, all, all of that sort of thing. Um, the physical demands of your work role will be looked at. So if you are, um, you know, a, a walker, but you have maybe impaired balance or you have weakness. So the physical demands would have to be looked at and maybe changing maybe your work setup to try and ease those demands on you, or maybe advise your employer to try and give you lighter work duties on your return uh, to work. Obviously transport as I've mentioned before, to and from, are you going to, do you have a car uh, so, and um, the feasibility of accessing and parking at your place of work um, and then other possible vulnerabilities that uh, need to be considered. Um, so when the person comes into me I'll go through a list of uh, various um, interview process with you so the main thing I suppose I'll be chatting to you about is what I call your present status and complaints. So where you're at now with your, your functional everyday living. So um, are you independent and getting up and dressed and the length of time it's taking you to carry out your personal self-care activities and then obviously getting out to work how you're managing to do that and then your fatigue and your energy levels associated with that and that can also give you an idea of your readiness to return to work because if you're finding you're very fatigued after just the morning routine that's going to have an impact on your ability to get up and out the door for work and um, obviously with remote working that eases some of that strain the commute isn't involved so that can help preserve capacity and um, so that's the other thing would we'll be looking at the bowel and bladder and how you're managing that your pain you know um, your accessible home environment so all those factors um, then the social situation where you're living has the community OT been out have you got the house adapted and um, what support systems you have in place um, and then I'll look at your educational history so um, you know your if you have qualifications or if you worked and you become skilled maybe in construction or skilled as a machine operative or other uh, professional training and um, so be looking at all those skills so if you can't get back to the physical demands of your previous work role is there something else you could possibly transfer into and um, be it a managerial position a supervisory position or working from bench height and um, working with your hands from bench height and um, if you have qualifications formal kind of um, professional qualifications say in something like academia or um, say in nursing or uh, one of the other professions that where you can fit back into your role within that as well um, and then in discussion with your employer I will be looking at certain accommodations as I've mentioned possibly a phased return to work usually I'd suggest maybe when you're starting to get back to work you would work alternate days maybe at reduced hours you might start a little bit earlier particularly if you're commuting and um, you might start about 10 so there's allowing your time just to get up and organize 
in the morning and you're possibly avoiding maybe the rush hour traffic. Uh, and then you'd go into work and then you'd maybe work a shorter day. And then the following day you'd have a rest day. So it's just allowing you to um, have rest days so that you're kind of giving yourself time for rest, but you're also giving yourself time to engage in an exercise program or attend medical appointments or whatever you need to do. Um, and then I'd also be linking in with your employer about maybe with, with your consent, just about the hidden, the possible hidden difficulties that you're experiencing so that they have um, an understanding um, of the possible challenges you're going to have when, when you get back to work. And it also reassured them that I'm available not only just to support you, but also to support your employer in your transition back to work. And, um, so, you know, if, uh, when you're back to work, if there's any, uh, if you're thinking of increasing your hours gradually, you can link in with me, your employer can link in with me on that. And I can write a letter of support on an ongoing basis uh, as much as you need me on there. Um, the other areas I would look at maybe in the interview would be your interests and your leisure. Um, they would be also very important as obviously with Smile Injuries Ireland really promote engaging activity, engaging leisure pursuits. Um, and that too is integral to your getting back to work. So if you can't get back to your pre-injury profession or pre-injury job, I might look at your areas of interest and see if there's any area within that that might give you an alternative vocational option that you hadn't thought of before. So the interview in the assessment is very much, we're both exploring as to the possibilities um, for your vocational planning. Um, obviously the financial aspects will be looked at. So also if you're under pressure to return to work, just to see linking in with maybe social work um, as to what kind of supports are available, what benefits. I know Philip is going to possibly hold another webinar about um, benefits and supports. And then also to have a chat with you about your ambition, your goals. So what is your plan? Uh, maybe what was your plan before the injury? And if that has been thrown up in the air now following your injury, what is your current plan and how best we can facilitate you realizing that? So the breakdown of the job demands, obviously I'd be looking at the job demands, the be it physical, uh, cognitive demands of the job, the, the specification of the job. Um, so the outline of your workday, as I've mentioned, the morning routine, the level of assistance you may need or not at all, the commute, are you cycling, walking, how are you getting to work, uh, parking as I've mentioned, the work providing a routine, a structured, um, a structure to your day, uh, and then how you cope with novelty within the workplace. If you have to change your role or transfer to an alternative role, how you're coping with that and adapting to that, and you, you know, ongoing support can be provided. And then the supervisory structure, as I said, if you're going back to work, there might be kind of self-doubt and a little bit of lacking confidence. So we, I would usually encourage the employer to provide kind of a structured supervisory sessions with you and um, just to instill with you your work competence and they give you feedback and that you're feeling kind of getting more comfortable with where you're at and maybe provide feedback as to areas maybe for improvement or um, further training or whatever it may be. Um, and then the type of work I would analyze as well be, as I mentioned, manual, sedentary, constantly demanding, pressurized, if it's target driven or managerial positions. Um, and then also if it, the work pattern every day, if it's fixed hours, if it's shift work, paid or unpaid or overtime work. If fatigue is an issue, I usually recommend to avoid shift work if possible. And I'd suggest your, your employer to accommodate you with daytime hours, uh, just so that you're not going to get excessively tired. Um, I think that's it, Philippa. Very good. Yeah, sorry. Great. So, I might get you to just stop your share screen there. Yeah, I go to that now. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fiona. That was great. Very interesting. And good to know what we need to consider on the return to work front. So I will pass you over to Karen now. So I might get Karen to unmute yourself. And I'll mute myself and we'll pass you over to Karen just to talk about her experience of returning to work. Thanks, Karen. Hi, can you hear me? 
<laughs> yep. Hear me? Yes. Yep, great. Okay, thanks, Philippa, for um, inviting me to share my return to work experience. So I was told to, to do the good, the bad and the ugly, so I've thrown it all in there. So just to tell you a bit about myself, I grew up in outside various villages in Wicklow and then I moved up to Dublin to do my nurse training, which is a fantastic career if you've got the trouble, travel bug like I had. I worked abroad for nine years in England, Jeddah, in Saudi and Australia, which I absolutely loved. So I returned to Ireland looking for a challenging job and I certainly found that. A new consultant was looking for a nurse to pioneer a new position in Ireland. So to cut a long, very long story short, a year later, both the hospital and I had agreed to do it, which was equally terrifying and exciting. Five years later, I realised it was one of the best decisions of my life when I fell off a four metre wall whilst on holiday near the Pyrenees and joined the very elite Spinal Injury Club. So I'm eternally grateful to Professor Prendival for giving me that opportunity as I'd specialised into a wheelchair friendly job. If I'd continued my old job, I'm not sure what I would have done as I was a staff nurse and outpatients running around in all the clinics. So it never entered my head that I wouldn't be able to return to work. While I was still in the NRH, the OT came with me for a work site visit. <clears throat> I was only on the way back. She said she'd been awake all night worrying about the visit because she knew it hadn't entered my head that um, I wouldn't go back to work. And she was thinking, she couldn't imagine that I would go back to work. And she thought she was the one that was going to have to tell me. So we visited work and she said, if I had to make up a job for somebody in a wheelchair, here's the right job. So she was, I think she was more relieved than I was. So that was great. And um, I was ergonomically tested for everything. So I was going to be doing surgery as well and was supposed to do no harm. So I got the green lights and I went back to work. I didn't rush going back to work because I was getting um, my sister and brother-in-law they kindly donated their double garage to me to um, convert into where I'm living now. So I took my time and I went back to work. And I was, I went to see the um, occupational health consultant who told me that he had lots of experience in helping people with spinal cord injuries returning back to work. So I thought, what could possibly go wrong? And I rang up. The new manager, there was a new director of nursing, a new assistant director of nursing. Everybody was new, who I hadn't met. Anyway, after lots of phone calls and I was saying had any of the adaptations been done, she said, oh, come back and it'll be much quicker if you're actually in place and they see you, then that'll speed it up. So I, um, I felt extremely lucky that I was able to go back to work. So I went back to work and really, to be honest, in hindsight, all I did was socialise for the first couple of weeks, really. I'd um, trained in the hospital and it had moved out with four other, three other hospitals that had closed. So, and I'll, just while I think of it, before I left um, the NRH, I was driving. So I, um, and the M50 had just opened about two months beforehand which was a mile away from me so that saved me trekking up and down the mountains so the M50 was a real gift for me getting to work so that was great um, and it was funny because there was a, a, a toilet in the corridor where I worked and when I was able-bodied I remember remarking to a few people it's a very wonky door there it's, it's it goes out and in and somebody's kind of eye roll and said that's for people with wheelchairs i explained that to me and they said it goes out so there's room for the wheelchair to go in and out little did i know how convenient that would be to me in later years <laughs> it's funny how things work out so anyway i always had my own room because i was running my own clinics 
and while I was in hospital, um, another nurse, it was quite funny because I was only paralyzed for two weeks and there was an ad in the paper which looked to everybody as if they were advertising my job and I'd get people kind of shifting from foot to foot, going red in the face and I'm thinking, are you building up to tell me that my job is advertised? And they'd say, oh, you know, thank God. I was saying, you know, the way I was there till 11 o'clock at night sometimes, I was a bit busy, that's for somebody else to help. So that was great. So there was somebody in sight when I went back. They were great. They said, you call the shots, you can work whatever hours you like, whatever days you like, very flexible. And half our job would be research and admin and stats and everything, and the other half looking after the patients. So they gave me complete flexibility. So I started off just doing the admin, and then I thought, this is very boring. I'd really like to see patients again. So I started off. I'm, I might as well tell you my job. The men might want to switch off for this bit. I was a colposcopist, which basically means that any lady is unfortunate enough to have an abnormal smear test, or if the smear taker thought, yeah, I'd like somebody else to have a close look at that area, they'd be trundled off to see someone like me. So as a wheelchair user, it's perfect because I'd be there and I take the history from the, on the computer and explain everything, answer questions, and then I'd ask them to get changed behind the curtain and then I'd be waiting for them to um, get, get on the couch and then afterwards I'd ask them to get dressed up again behind the curtain and I'd be beside the computer so they wouldn't know that I hadn't actually stood up to walk back from place to place. So perfect, um, the perfect job. But unfortunately, my um, counterpart, it was great having somebody else in the row, but she unfortunately liked my room. So it took me six months to get her out of my room. So I had everything uh, between three different rooms and filing cabinets that I couldn't really access and everything. So that was a complete disaster. Um, in hindsight, there's lots of things I could do about it, but I guess it's all about mindset. And anyway. I um, got that sorted out eventually. My other challenge was that you have to get the couch in the position to um, get the patient comfortable and that I can see exactly what I'm looking at. And there were six big foot pedals for that, which extended about a foot each side of my lap. So if you can imagine me with that on my lap, it's a bit, a bit of a challenge. So one of the reps came in a good while after I started, after I popped in to see how I was getting on. Oh, I said, oh, it's great, great to be back doing everything. But I said, the foot pedals are a challenge. So he looked suitably horrified and he says, did nobody get your hand controls? I said, hand controls? He goes, I'll be back tomorrow. Who knew there was such an invention? So my life was um, miraculously changed overnight when I had six tiny little hand controls to, to do. So they were, they were my challenges, but everybody was very, very supportive. Um, I asked the secretary what, um, if any of the patients made any remarks about having a wheelchair user. And she said, well, they used to ask, because um, sometimes there'd be two of us doing the clinic, and sometimes they'd say, oh, with the girl with the red hair, is she? And I want to see her, whereas now it's the girl with the wheelchair. So it was used as a distinguishing factor rather than, I was wondering what they say, for goodness sake, am, am I not bad enough without a wheelchair user looking after me? So anyway, that was, um, and she said there was a lot of people asking to be seen by me. So that was extremely reassuring because of it's all about what goes on in your head, not what actually happens. So I was glad I'd asked that. And there was a patient that I saw after I was back. And as we were saying goodbye after her examination, I said to her, um, oh, it's nice to see somebody that knew me before my wheelchair days. And she looked at me 
and she looked at the wheelchair and she looked at me again and she looked absolutely horrified. She came back and she goes, what's with the wheelchair? And I said, I do not notice. She goes, God no, she goes, I was so terrified about what I was coming in with. I didn't. She goes, look, we're not concerned about you. I have to be honest. We're just glad to see you, but you know, we're so worried about ourselves, never even noticed. And that was the same with another lady I asked a while later. So I said, don't feel bad. That's absolutely the best thing that you could have possibly said to me. So that was great. So I was always very passionate about my careers. I'd fundraised and set up the department myself. So it was brilliant to be able to go back to normal. So it meant that I was financially secure and it's good for socially as well and um, helps you to lead a more rewarding and fulfilling life. Of course you can do that without going back to work but it just helps. So I did that for 10 years and then I discovered a business that I could run from home so I actually took early retirement and I'm doing that. I think Something to remember when you go back to work is, and I would have been a bit like this myself, is an awful lot of people haven't come across a wheelchair user before and they're not quite sure what to do with you. So I think the more relaxed we are, and even making jokes about it, then the more relaxed they are and they realise you're actually just a normal human being, but you just have a different mode of transport. So... Um, yeah, I'd strongly recommend going back to work if you can, even if you have to learn new skills. It's very rewarding. So that's it. That's great, Karen. Thank you. It was great to hear. And uh, very much appreciated. We'll, we'll pop the questions at the end. We might pass over to Connor now to just give us a, his rundown of his experience, and then we'll come to the questions and answers again. Well, thank you, Karen. That was brilliant. Thanks. Now I'll get you to unmute, Connor. I'll start again now. Good job. Thank you very much, Philippa and Fiona, for your presentation. And uh, good to hear Karen's side of the story. I know Karen well from doing peer mentoring over the years. I myself was injured in 1981. So it's 39 years ago. And maybe from my the looks you can Garner from my expression, I'm, I'm actually retired now, so I've been <laughs> working a long time. I was a T10 injury, so I was um, probably quite um, mobile in that I had the, my full use of arms to get about, and from a very early stage I was able to drive a car and get mobile, so some of them issues are also quite important too. My initial background then was working manually. I was, in actual fact, I was, I was involved in motorcycle racing, and I incurred an injury T10 uh, in 1981. And so my background at that stage was a manual worker, be it working with cars, vans, or motorcycles for a living. I then had to try and migrate onwards. And that's always the challenge, I suppose, for an awful lot of people that might inhibit them once they're used to manually working, working in agriculture or driving a truck, and suddenly then they're not able to do the uh, skills that they had before. They have to go and develop new ones. That's what faced me back in 1981, 82. And fortunately, around that time, computers came on the scheme on the scene uh, uh, in the early days, and there was um, a, a computer course put together by the then National Rehabilitation Board. So they did, and uh, I actually went along with fourteen or fifteen others, I think, at the time. We did it in the rehabilitation centre in 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 Rochetown Avenue, uh, and uh, we did a course at night time over a, a year or two. And a lot of us got, gathered an awful lot of new skills and were able to then start adapting into the new workplaces that were emerging at the time. Fortunately, I got one um, and, and, and uh, started originally with the, uh, the revenue commissioners of all people, the tax man. I was in uh, at the civil service and uh, immediately they had to put in place facilities for me to get in and out of, of the place. So as they said, I had a car to drive in, which was pretty good at the time actually given that public access was very very limited in 1981 even getting up and down the footpaths was a pretty much of a challenge in those days it's quite marvelous how uh, infrastructure has changed publicly everywhere now in this day and age and immediately the public service put in place a a, a bathroom facility and everything getting in and reserved a car space for me 
So an awful lot of that was done off my own bat. We, I must marvel at the facilities that are available now or that are organized through Fiona after seeing your presentation. It really is extensive, the amount that can be done for you in, in advance. Whereas back in those days, it was just turn up for the interview, see if you get it, do an, do an, an assessment, challenge us to your ability to work and, and then go in there and get on with it. And I think the more I did that, the more it became apparent that this person is able to handle themselves and you just joined in be it at lunch coffee or socializing in the pub afterwards and then driving home in the car well you got away with it in those days so where but i can i i continued on then doing the computer course at night time and i eventually uh, completed it and got a qualification out of it which was very lucky now it took quite a while to do and it took quite a while to get my actual my mindset around the idea of working with your hand all the time and then trying to adapt yourself to working with them uh, in, in some other form of work, particular uh, an academic sort of thing, a qualification. It was all very new, but gladly it did work for me. I had to persist and work quite hard at it. And any effort in order to get back to normality requires a bit of effort. So it, once you find your efforts and rewards, it's, it's very self-satisfying. So Back in, that's what, 1982, 83, 84. And I, I, I look at you then got a, a work experience course with um, AIB actually. And I've worked for a, with AIB until last February when I retired at age 65. So I'm enjoying a quiet life now at the time, albeit not, not, so, not so free as I'd like to be with COVID restrictions, etc. In the times I went to AIB, though, I did move around with an awful lot of buildings. AIB is set up all around the country, buildings here, there and everywhere. And uh, there was opportunities to move about and be part of a team to go in and evaluate things for computerization. And there was no, there was times when I went along to various buildings and there was no, oper no facilities. I might have to park out in the street or I might just get into the building and then go and have to go back to another AIB building for a, a toilet facility or such like things. Given my ability to be able to manually move about and get in and out of a car and go off and come back. But one by one, I managed to get the facilities departments in all these buildings adapted bit by bit. And now of course it's a standard, it's a standard facility made in most places that uh, facilities are made available or they're assessed in advance by Fiona, which is marvelous to see. But I did spend quite a while in, in, in my early days through the 80s when facilities weren't as greatly available and just going to ask for them or they would make sure they were prepared for in advance and we did a lot of work of taking down existing cubicles on a particular floor and reshaping them into into ones that would let me get in and out. I also had a number of um, colleagues or friends over the years I had met in AIB and, and other computer organizations, people who, who weren't as fortunate as I was with, with the full use of their arms and hands and needed the, the, their hands were maybe, uh, they might have been a, in two cases, there were high injuries, cervical injuries with tetraplegia and their hand function wasn't as good and they were well able to adapt themselves and think as we know with uh, adaptions you can put on your hands. But even though they're, even with that, their, their new colleagues would help them you know with everything they wanted to do or to get pushed down to the restaurant or even help them into the bathroom I, I remember a colleague having his 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 um leg bag being emptied by colleagues who are well well glad to just get familiar and, and help them out along the way and, and it was very very encouraging for them because those people learned that as fiona or as karen pointed out once they realized you, you are just a regular person you're ready to participate work with people socialize and if they learn about your various inhibitions, be it sometimes you don't get in on time or you need an assistance down in the bathroom, all you have to do is ask for it. And some of them quite willing. You set up very good personal relationships with some staff members who get to know you personally and they're willing to let the uh, be available for you. Very, very encouraging. So I, I certainly would say my experience over the years would be to very much in, encourage anyone in participating in any course or anything that's offered them. You must open doors. Only when you open those doors will you find a light will shine or you will be encouraged through and you will be welcomed. It's, it's great to re reinforce yourself. I'm also quite aware that an awful lot of people might have concerns about going to back to work, to losing their access to the medical card or other expenses and everything else that they might need to do. I suppose they're all dealt with by 
Fiona's team in OT as to what needs to be considered in advance. Certainly in my time, um, uh, once I got working, I was able to afford uh, the, the, the bare necessities I, I, I needed uh, and, and got a wheelchair every couple of years and one thing or another. But um, that, that certainly reinforced my um, ability to keep continuing on and going up the career ladder and all worked out very well right to the very end. So I'll, I'll not hold up any more on that really they're my experiences and I'd be glad to answer any questions help anyone or reassure them and what they're trying to do in the future would be the best thing for them thank you great Connor thank you so much um, and thank you to all three of our speakers that was fantastic and uh, as we said we're hoping this is the first in a series on returning to employment because I know there's a lot of areas as Fiona mentioned the entitlements and social welfare and Connor, as you touched on there, um, there's a lot of assistive technology out there as now that can support people. And Karen as well with the hand controls you had mentioned. So, you know, those simple little adaptions that you could get in that might make work a bit easier for people and just make that adjustment a bit easier. So I'm just going to go through some of the chats and comments here. We see what we have. We have one in. Greetings from work. This is my third week working after being off for 174 weeks. This is only a temporary job, which is great for getting me back into the routine. Well, that's fantastic to hear and congratulations. Very reassuring. So now let me see a question for Fiona. So can people directly refer themselves to the NRH vocational program or do they need a GP to link them in? Um, if the person uh, ha is under the care of a consultant here, rehabilitation consultant, they can just ring uh, me here in the vocational service and I can follow up. Um, but if they don't, they need to get their GP or another uh, healthcare professional just to fill out the NRH referral form. It's on the NRH website. Um, or they need to put a consultant's name on that form, be it Dr. Emer Smith or... Um, uh, you know, one of the other consultants, and then the the doctor will then see them for a review, and then they'll refer them on to me. But they have to be under the care of a consultant. Yeah, we have consultants. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I'll just see. There was a oh a comment in for Karen. I can see you responded to that, Karen. Um, very inspiring. Thanks for taking the time to chat to us. Came in from Carol. Um, a text message from Mary. I want to link into some uh, link in with someone who has a spinal cord injury and work. How can I do this? And I can see Emily has responded. Um, Hilary Keppel is our wonderful peer support coordinator. So the way that works is you can give her a ring or email her, and she will see what your needs are and assess who's the best person to link in with. Um, another one here. Connor and Karen, uh, one piece of advice you could give people who are considering going back to work um, following a spinal cord injury. So any one piece of advice that you might pass out there, both of you? I would say if you need part of your work adapted, make sure it's done beforehand. I mean, the fact that I didn't even have a room to go back to meant that I couldn't get anything adapted. Okay. So, I would, and in hindsight, I'm thinking, why didn't I ring the lovely OT from NRH or, or somebody and get back up? But don't be fobbed off. Just say, I'll go back when the room is ready for me. Brilliant. Very good. And how about you, Connor? Certainly. What I would, what I would endorse straight away, and this came up at one of the other return to work um, seminars we had where people were concerned that if they put in for a, an interview and went for the job that they might not mention their disability until they got there which we I, I certainly did not suggest that they should do that I think the most best piece of advice is to be very much up front and say very much from the outset who you are and what you are and what your concerns are and, your, and, and that you do have a mobility issue you know, it's not necessarily a disability. You can't work. It, your issue is a mobility issue. That's all it is. Your ability, your 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 desire to actually work is definitely definitely there. So to be upfront would really be, the advice would be to be as have a very open and honest. And sometimes you you might have to suddenly express yourself to this interviewer who it might be to actually say these are your concerns. These are my 
bathroom consent and this and that. And once you are open like that and you get a reciprocating reply from them, you'll feel far more comfortable. That's the best way to be open and honest about your situation and best to express yourself. If you're holding yourself back in any way, it'll only take with you. Don't do that to yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Tell the word do it sitting abled. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so do we have a message in from Tim just to say thank you to all the speakers and positivity came across that's great and um, Emily has just put in a comment yes we have um, a webinar on the 25th of November now this is for 18 to 29 year olds so it might exclude some that are on here today um, and that's talking about the IWA ability program and helping that age group um, getting back into work, they do a lot of CV prep, interview skills, things like that. Um, and as we mentioned, if anyone has any suggestions, we'd love to continue this kind of series of webinars. So we're hoping to do social welfare entitlements, assistive technology. But if anyone has any suggestions or things that you think you would like to hear on returning to work, we'd love to hear from you. So you can email myself or Emily, and I'm sure she'll share our details there at the bottom. Um, or you can ring the office or your community outreach officer. Mm -hmm. Philippa, I was just going to add there, just in relation to the returning to work and the adaptations that Karen and Connor mentioned, there are reasonable accommodations that the government have put in place, uh, such as the Workplace Equipment and Adaptation Grant. And if you are not working, if you're not working in the public sector, your employer or if you're self-employed are eligible to apply for that grant. So it could be to put in a ramp or it could be for ergonomic supports or for EAT devices. So um, there are supports in the community. Um, the other thing I failed to mention in my report was I do, when you come here uh, to the vocational service, obviously I link in with the community outreach officers. Uh, and I would liaise with them on an ongoing basis every two weeks. And I go through the patients that are referred and then the community outreach officers link in with me as to where the patients are out in the community and what, where they are in relation to their journey back to work and if they need to be redirected back to me um, for additional support or guidance. So it's kind of an ongoing um, support system throughout their lifetime really. Um, so or their working life I should say. So I failed to mention that so I just wanted to get that in. Thanks. <laughs> Not a bother. Thank you Fiona. And yes there is, as I said, there is a lot of supports. I know there's Microfinance Ireland as well. So um, that's something we come across a lot of people looking at setting up their own business. So there are a lot more supports out there. And I suppose now, as we're currently going through COVID, um, as you said, the options for remote working have been highlighted and that might be something that would be of benefit to people with a spinal injury as well. So it's kind of opening up the playing field a little bit. Um, so that's great. I just want to say a huge thank you to Fiona, Connor and Karen. Really appreciate you coming on today and talking to us. And a huge thank you to all our attendees for taking time out and joining us today. Um, we'll hopefully have this recording shortly, so for anyone who missed it, they can link in in the future. And we'll continue to keep you updated with any other webinars we have on this, um, on this series. So thank you very much, and we'll say goodbye to everyone. Hi, right. thank, thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's